information system, cybersecurity, best practices, and lessons learned. Um, I'm Tritium's uh, CTO, Kevin Smith. And today, if you have questions at any time, uh, don't use the raised hand feature. Instead, use the Q&A button to queue up your questions so we can see them and be, uh, and if we can't answer them during the presentation, we'll have a Q&A session at the end. Today's Tritium talk is packed with content, so I'm just gonna jump right on in. Over the last three months, many of our buildings have looked like this, empty. As the world shut down as a result of COVID-19, we found ourselves with a new perspective. Many of us have been working from our homes and working remotely, and we all know building automation systems provide real value for innovation and energy cost savings, and in situations like the one that we've been facing, it's important now more than ever that organizations be able to realize this value when their buildings are utilized in a much more limited capacity. So businesses have had to operate differently. Many organizations have set up remote connectivity into their building systems so they could be remotely managed. But sadly, we know for a fact that many of those systems aren't set up securely and they're actually exposed on the internet to potential hackers and cyber attacks. Complicating the matter, with the remote management reality of COVID-19, those who are connecting in are connecting in from mostly insecure networks, with insecure computers, communicating over insecure and probably unpatched home routers. And this is a new type of problem. So with the reality of COVID-19, the cyber threat landscape is more dangerous than ever. And hackers have been taking advantage of this new way of doing business. They've been attacking hospitals, end users, and businesses. And it's important that you know that building systems aren't immune. Uh, in the last six months, you've probably read it in the news, Snake Ransomware has been attacking entire networks, not just hosts, but entire networks, and not only affecting corporate IT networks, but OT networks as well, because they are variants that target specific OT devices. And vulnerabilities in products are, are still being reported. In fact, last week, a set of vulnerabilities called Ripple 20 was announced, critical vulnerabilities that affect hundreds of millions of IoT and industrial control systems. So, super important. And it means that all of us need to take cybersecurity seriously and proactively manage our systems against these evolving threats. So today in this talk, I'll talk about the threats to today's building systems. I'll cover what affects your building cybersecurity posture. I'll talk about the roles that stakeholders need to play. I'll give you best practices and guidance, including those from the US federal government. And finally, I'll talk about what we've been doing security-wise at Tritium including some of the new features that we've added to make your cybersecurity posture stronger. Now, I want all of you to realize just how real this is. And I'll do this by talking about real attacks that we've heard about when talking to our customers and business partners. And, and I want to mention, I'm going to do so without mentioning the affected parties by name for privacy reasons. Some of the examples are from Niagara Systems and some are from non-Niagara systems. And I'd like to thank Fred Gordy from Intelligent Buildings and uh, Chip Block from the security company Evolving, Evolver for their insight on some of these uh, recent threats. So we've been seeing ransomware and malware events quite a bit. These types of events on building systems are happening regularly. And specifically, they're happening in cases where a supervisor machine is the same machine where somebody's checking email or surfing the web or social media. And what happens is somebody clicks on a bad link or a bad email attachment and it encrypts everything or malware infects everything. Um, equally so, we're also seeing it on systems that are connected to networks where people are checking email and browsing the web. And, and people don't think about this very often, um, but if your supervisor is actually on the same network where someone is browsing the web and checking email, uh, your supervisor could be at risk as well. And we're seeing this. 
Um, we've seen situations where people downloaded unknowingly a remote access Trojan that, that specifically targeted the OT network and shut everything down for a very long time. We've seen outages between somewhere between two weeks and six months. Um, and so in many of those cases, there are cases where uh, they were victims of malware or ransomware and they didn't have backups. And so six months is a really long time to go without your systems. We are seeing that insecure remote access attacks are prevalent. We've seen a number of situations where remote access to BMS is set up in an insecure way, allowing attackers to get into the network. And these attacks really vary and, and the situations vary too. Sometimes it's when there's an avenue into your network that you just didn't know about. Other times it's when someone had uh, connected your system directly onto the internet and exposed it onto the internet uh, so that it was discoverable and attackers get in that way. We know this is the case when we look at the website Shodan or Census or Zoomai, these websites that are out there, um, they index and allow you to look at systems that are directly exposed on the internet, essentially advertising themselves for hackers. And unfortunately, there's a page dedicated to industrial control systems and building control systems that are exposed on the internet. So really important, uh, if, if you, it, it's important that you check, are you exposed on the internet? Because uh, a lot of organizations think they aren't, and they are. And we're seeing a lot of threats in the self-inflicted category too. I heard this phrase last week and I thought it was funny. Uh, I'd never heard it before, Larry code. And someone said, I have a lot of Larry code on my system. And I said, what's that? And he said, oh, Larry code. It's when there's a guy named Larry, he wrote a bunch of code and nobody understands it but Larry. And in order to change it, you need Larry's help or you need to really study it before you do anything with it. And um, there's an example of this that I'm aware of where uh, an individual left an organization and they removed his account from the building control system, not knowing that the system was set up in such a way that it used that person's credentials to connect and control 100 different sites. I mean, really, really tough. Um, because they deleted the account, they weren't able to recover because they didn't know his password. He was not available to give the password. It took apparently two man years to recover from that. Think about that, 100 different sites. And of course, there are a lot of situations where organizations will do major system changes or even small system changes without testing and without understanding the ramifications, including one where an organization pushed out an update to their building control systems, um, to one of the modules in the building control systems, and it disrupted operations in 50 different sites for two days where they had to cancel um, really critical operations. Um, so these things happen. Some are self-inflicted, but many of them are not. And many of them are situations where you are a target from hackers. And forgive me if you've heard this story before, but I think it's a, it's a good one. And it, it really gives you a good message. Um, I, I've told this story a, a couple of times and, and I think it, it deserves uh, being repeated. Uh, a few years ago, there was a casino in Las Vegas and they were remodeling and they decided they wanted to put in a giant aquarium filled with exotic fish that would look beautiful. And they thought, well, since we're going big, we should go smart. So they got a smart aquarium and they connected it into their network so that the facility manager could monitor all the things that he needed to take care of in this big aquarium. Uh, water temperature, alkalinity, et cetera. And it worked great. Facility manager got notifications on his phone on what he needed to do, what he needed to add. Um, but after a while, everybody noticed that the network was really slow and they got a lot of complaints. Why is the network so slow? Why is my Wi-Fi so slow? And after doing some investigation, they realized there's a whole lot of traffic coming 
out of the aquarium into the network, but also going towards that aquarium. And as they looked deeper into the situation, it turned out there was a sensor uh, thermometer uh, that was taking the temperature in the, in the aquarium, but that's not all it was doing. It had malware on it and it was attacking every device, every computer, everything on that casino's network. And unfortunately, it was doing it successfully. So it was able to break into the VIP gamblers database for that casino, steal a lot of sensitive private information about the gamblers who frequented that casino and streamed it over the internet. So friends, what, what this should tell you is that every device you connect to your network should have an impact on your building cybersecurity. It does have an impact on it. Before you add a device, you should ask, is the manufacturer cyber aware? Is that manufacturer adding strong cybersecurity controls? Because guess what? Some don't. Some manufacturers just want to sell products cheaply and they can't justify the cost themselves for adding cybersecurity capabilities, so they don't. An equally important question is, once I buy this product, will they support it? Will they patch it if there are vulnerabilities in it? Will they allow me to install fixes? Because guess what? A lot of them don't. This is really important for you to know. And, and also, for any device on your network, who's installing it? Is the installer cyberware? Do they know how to securely set it up? And then finally, who's actually actively monitoring all the devices in my network? Who's monitoring this aquarium that I'm connecting into my network? These are incredibly important questions for you to ask. And, and so if you look at this from an organizational perspective, it's a lot more than just devices and things on your network. Cybersecurity is really about people. It's about people, processes, and technology. And people are probably the biggest factor here, right? People who are in charge of the network need to understand how to set it up securely, right? And how to configure it, right? People who are integrators need to be cyber aware and know best practices for configuring those systems. Not just building automation systems, but everything that you're connecting to your network. And certainly, the people who are involved in developing these products need to have a very strong and rigorous cybersecurity process so that you can feel comfortable putting it on your network, right? And certainly security is about process too. Not a big book of process that nobody reads, but you need practical processes related to cyber that will help the people in your organization do the right thing. So this is super good timing because uh, just about a month ago, an organization in the United States, the US Department of Homeland Security, Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, which was established two years ago, they came up with some guidance, but it wasn't just CISA. It was CISA along with the Department of Energy and the UK's National Cybersecurity Center or NCSC and they produce joint guidance for industrial control systems. And it, before you kind of zone out when you hear industrial control systems, when you think industrial control systems or hear ICS, think you're building control systems because it is absolutely directly applicable. And so the great thing about this guidance that they released is it's two pages long. It's an infographic but it is jam packed with a lot of information. So uh, they, this, this two page document has, you know, this little chart that I have on the screen that talks about some of the biggest vulnerability that, that they found when they've been um, doing assessments of, of systems, right? Really important. So what I've done is I've gone through and I've taken some of the guidance and I've referred to that document um, along with some other things. And so this is how I will talk about the best practices. So the first one, super important, risk management and governance. This is actually what cybersecurity is all about. Uh, and the big questions that you should ask are the most important and the most critical are, and, and the most basic. So, Take an inventory of everything on your network. 
what what's your network how's it configured how's it set up what assets and devices are connected to your network and and on those devices what software is on them what version of the software is on it what operating system is on that device are they all up to date with patches how are those devices and assets configured are they properly configured who in your organization is actually using those assets and how are they using it and probably most importantly who in your organization is actually managing these assets these seem like basic questions but really answering them can be a challenging task um, I want to refer you to a couple of articles by Fred Gordy from Intelligent Buildings that he posted last month on LinkedIn. If you're not connected to him on LinkedIn, just uh, send him a, a LinkedIn request. He, he writes some really good cybersecurity articles focused on building automation systems. And in these articles last month, he talked about how in practice, a lot of organizations think someone else is managing some of their assets. Uh, so IT, may think that OT is managing uh, certain assets and OT thinks that IT is doing it on and on and on when in, in actuality nobody's managing certain assets and this causes huge cybersecurity problems. I always say that having periodic risk assessments of, of your networks is incredibly valuable. Uh, because if you bring in a third party, especially a third party, they'll be able to identify blind spots the organization has about security. They'll be able to discover the assets they have on your network, how they're configured, and all of that. And, and they'll be able to identify certain risks that maybe you didn't know about. And, and chances are you didn't. I always say periodic because your organization changes you have, uh, you're always adding things to your networks. You're always changing things on your networks. The software on your devices um, are not static, right? And so you, you really do need to have a handle on, you know, what's there and what's installed on it and, and what are my risks. And finally, policies and procedures for your organization are crucial. Crucial, as I mentioned before, uh, the great thing is you've got a lot of great organizations like uh, NIST and um, you, the standard ISA 62443, and you have other standards guidance. I have a ton of links at the end of this presentation um, that you can download after you see the presentation and you can go there um, in order to get more information. The network, it's critical. How you set up your network, and, and we recommend a defense in depth network strategy where you segment your network and where you uh, separate your network into different control zones. So that if attacker does get in, he's gonna have to do uh, more work in order to, to go and um, get into the critical assets of your network. And so uh, this is an area where your IT department or the IT people, they really shine here um, because you know, the, the IT people typically have a lot of experience on securely setting up networks. Um, and, you know, typically a different set of skills for, for the OT department. So another great reason why OT and IT really need to work together. Uh, they, they can learn a lot from each other. Physical security, super important. I used to not talk about this much, uh, but if you think about it, if you have your, your building systems and your JCs and supervisors in an area that's not protected, somebody could walk up to them and disconnect them from the network or, or do something nefarious to them. Um, it's funny, uh, last year I was teaching a Niagara TCP class, uh, at least part of it in cybersecurity, and I was talking about the threats that a lot of systems face and someone raised their hand and they said what if somebody takes your supervisor and i say what do you mean like hacks it or takes it over and they said no somebody came into our building and took it so they disconnected it from the network unplugged it and just stole the computer so uh, really important to think about 
and a lot of people don't. They think about securely configuring their systems, but maybe not so much the, the physical security aspect. Due diligence, um, there is a part of that CISA document that, that talks about supply chain management. That's kind of what I, I referenced before when I talked about the aquarium. Always do your homework on what systems you're gonna bring into your network. Uh, building control systems, absolutely. But really anything, any device, any system that you bring into your network, you need to do your homework here. We do that from a um, manufacturing perspective because our, our JACE is made up of parts and components built by other organizations. And so we do our due diligence before we bring it in. Um, the same way with software, we have third party software that we sometimes bring into Niagara. And so we have to do a ton of due diligence um, before we actually add this to our products that we then pass on to you. Um, this is one of those issues that, um, that has come up with the Ripple 20 vulnerability that was you know, brought up you know, last week because it's having a ripple effect on so many devices because so many people are using uh, third party software that's affected. Uh, and this just happens. And so that's why supply chain management is important. Proactive and active management of all your assets is critical. You need to have a culture of patching and vulnerability management, but not only that, configuring your systems uh, correctly and configuring them securely and always monitoring what they're doing. Um, I wanna take this as an opportunity to, to, to say something. If you have an older version of Niagara, you're not taking advantage of all the cybersecurity capabilities and the cybersecurity fixes that we've rolled into our products. We are constantly fixing potential vulnerabilities in Niagara and also the JS8000. And it is critical that you keep your systems up to date. Otherwise, you, you are at risk. Uh, not only that, uh, we have uh, great new capabilities like the security dashboard, which will show you um, exactly how your systems are configured and what you need to change to make it more secure, right? So we're, we're, as we're releasing new versions of Niagara, we're trying to make it easy for you to secure your systems and easier, but we're also fixing potential vulnerabilities. So it's super crucial that you upgrade. Um, not only that, if you have an AX system, it's about to go end of life. So the great news is we have all sorts of programs that we can help you with. We have a trade up program, et cetera, and it will allow you to get all of your systems um, up to date so that your organizations aren't going to be at risk for cybersecurity issues. Finally, people are often the biggest risk. So it's important that the people in your organization, the users, the managers of, of your systems, um, and the integrators, it's important that they're up to date on cybersecurity processes. It's really super important that OT and IT have a healthy exchange of information and everybody knows who's managing what, right? For owners, I think this is really important for you to understand. One, you need to ch you need to choose your integrators um, based on how cyber aware they are and if they use cybersecurity best practices, right? And and the people managing your systems need to be manage them, understanding these cybersecurity best practices. There there are some ways that you can do this um, pretty easily. You can put in cybersecurity re requirements in your contracts, right? Uh, if you're using Niagara 4.8 and later, which I hope you are, you can point to the security dashboard and, and you could say, I need a certain level of cybersecurity before I sign off on the installation and configuration of my system. Because I want assurance that this system was set up in a, um, in a secure way. 
And finally, you might even want to, to put in verbiage about uh, requiring a third party risk assessment because cybersecurity really is that critical. And um, I, I think this is just a, w a great way that you can move forward. Finally, I want to talk about some of the capabilities and controls in Niagara. And this next slide, I typically don't show it to a lot of people because a lot of people don't necessarily want to know how the sausage is made. But if, but if you go back to that aquarium example, it's actually really important that you know how the sausage is made. It's important when you bring a device or a system onto your network to know what, what are this organization that made this thing? Do they have good cybersecurity processes? Do they have good cybersecurity capabilities? Will they support the product? And, and we want you all to know that Tritium takes cybersecurity very seriously. And as we were preparing for Niagara 4, uh, seven plus years ago, we, we chose a standard, a great standard, um, ISA 62443. And we looked at the security requirements for the highest levels um, of industrial control systems. And, and we wanted to identify what are the gaps between, uh, between what we currently provide and what's required for the highest level. And we identified gaps and we were able to, to meet those gaps, looking at those security requirements. And, and uh, as a result, I'm very proud of what this team has been able to do um, and the capabilities that we've been able to build into our products. We are doing uh, a lot of security reviews internally, design reviews, code reviews, threat modeling, um, automated security testing. And we're not adding process just because we love process. We're, we're adding these processes to make us develop and um, release a, a better product, a more secure product, because se security really does matter to, to the whole team the development team, everyone, right? Um, not only are we doing a lot of internal testing and internal reviews, but we periodically and routinely work with external parties to pen test our systems. So we've partnered with the federal government to pen test our products, sometimes before we release it. Because I think this is helpful because we all have blind spots. And so when you go to an external team, and um, they, might, they might find some things that you don't know about. So we've gone to pen testing companies, we've gone to the federal government, we've partnered with customers in pen testing our products. And, and the great thing is when we find stuff, we roll those fixes into Niagara and the next version of Niagara. Sometimes we like release uh, emergency patches, um, but we always roll in the fixes for those into the next version of Niagara another reason why you really need to stay up to date with the latest version of Niagara. And finally, we are constantly testing our product. We're, we're constantly uh, looking for uh, you know, new, new vulnerabilities that we can fix. We're looking at our third party modules and we wanna make sure that, that everything that we release and the latest version of what we released is the most secure and, and we're doing that. And so I want to assure you that um, our, our support is, is second to none, especially as we're looking at um, making sure that we have the most secure product available for you. And so I'm not gonna be able to go through all of the security capabilities of Niagara, but, but I wanted you all to see this and the slides are gonna be available so that you know that we have a uh, a, a lot of security controls in Niagara, starting with authentication and strong authentication mechanisms. Many people are not aware that we support multi-factor authentication or uh, support SAML single sign-on with the identity provider. In Niagara 4.9, we're actually releasing a Niagara identity provider so that you don't have to integrate with a third-party one, right? 
Um, and so Niagara 49, we're really excited about that. Um, we provide integration with all sorts of security infrastructure. We uh, allow you to set up um, good role-based auth authorization. Uh, we do encryption of all communications by default, encryption of sensitive information on disk. We digitally sign all our code and it's validated for integrity and source at runtime in the same way um, the JS8000, Edge 10, they come with secure boot. So if an attacker tries to maliciously alter what's on uh, Niagara, it's just not, it's not gonna run, right? At the same time, we've provided so many uh, other capabilities. Uh, some of the newest one uh, we're really excited about in 4.9 is uh, we have some new enhanced security logging and auditing. Um, and so uh, anything security related uh, will go to that security audit log. And if, if you want to add one, and if you want to add a security facet to any component within Niagara that can be logged when there's a chain, change, you can do that. And so uh, not only that, I've talked about it once before, but in 4.8, we released the security dashboard, and this is great. And when you have a lot of devices, it's important that you know their security posture. And so we have the security dashboard. It gives you visibility and how well you're doing and configuring all your security settings, not only for one station, but actually every Niagara system on your network. Um, you have to have Niagara 4.8 and above in order to take advantage of that. And I think it's, it's really important that you do. And finally, as, as we've been on this cybersecurity journey, we have um, used the principle of secure by default. When someone chooses the default settings in Niagara, it's the most secure. And so I've, I've hit some of these uh, on, on this slide, I'm not gonna go into them all, but this is our philosophy that, that, we're, that we're focused on. Um, this is how our software is set up. We're gonna continue to do this. And at the end of this slide, uh, these presentation slides, we have Tritium resources uh, focused on what we've created related to cybersecurity guidance for you, um, starting with hardening guides, but also videos, Tritium talks, and articles. Um, and there are also some external resources that you, you're going to be able to, to use once you download this presentation. Uh, at this point, I'd like to... Uh, introduce James Johnson from Tritium and Bill Smith. And they, they have been looking at your questions as they've been rolling, rolling in. And uh, you know, together, I think we can answer some of the, the Q&A that we've gotten during this presentation. So if you guys wanna. I'll tackle, I guess, the first one. Um, somebody was asking about uh, cloud-based Niagara and should uh, the recommendation be behind a VPN, but the customer, their customer wants to uh, publicly expose it. Um, I mean, still the best practices I think that we would recommend, and, and James has a lot of uh, experience with um, customers, is to still be behind a VPN. Um, if you're going to do any kind of cloud interface, um, I would say the recommendation would be find a way to uh, obfuscate it away um, with a uh, maybe like a, a supervisor that you know, basically represents just read only type stuff. Um, but generally speaking, if you're going to provide any kind of control, the best practice I think is still VPN. Um, hopefully that answers that question. James, do you have anything you would add to that? No, I agree with what you said, Bill. Hey, Kevin, there's also a question from Scott Dite. He was asking if you were going to make available the CISA document that you mentioned. Is there a link to that in your presentation? Yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll post this presentation at the end, but um, yeah, there, there is uh, a link to that. And so it's a, it's a great two pager, really easy to digest. Um, I thought it was really cool that they partnered with the United Kingdom in this too. Um, so it's not just a United States kind of thing. Um, 
and and they they focused on industrial control systems and i do want to just bring this up again it it directly applies to us and so um you know the two page in infographic is a great way for you to kind of get a sense of am i doing it, it am i doing everything in the right way and how do i get started and then um hopefully the other resources that we have um at the end of this this presentation are enough to kind of give you kind of the next steps of um you know some of the specific actions that you can take Another question that was asked was regarding um, uh, Niagara basically providing a basically a, a certificate authority mechanism to help smaller customers out instead of trying them trying to uh, work through IT issues with uh, certificates, et cetera. It's a very good question and it's a tough one to answer. We have actually talked about it and revisited that multiple times. Uh, the biggest issue I think is ultimately um, you, Honeywell, Tritium, Niagara as, as, as an organization is not really set up to be a certificate authority. And for web services, if you understand what a certificate authority actually does, uh, before they grant you that certificate, they go out there and they are going to validate, one, that you own the domain, and two, uh, that you're a legitimate business in good standing, yada, yada, yada. So they take a whole lot of responsibility um, and accountability too in being a CA and uh, being that we're a software development organization, we are not really structured to do that in a way that I believe we would feel comfortable properly vetting. In addition, one of the other issues you run into with any CA is that if everybody's installing these things as recommended on internal networks, uh, there's really it's really difficult for an external CA to validate uh, that kind of thing. As a matter of fact, most will not. Um, so if you have your internal network and you have a handful of JSONs with a host name on that internal network, there's no, the, the CAs aren't going to, aren't going to validate that because they're just not in a good position to do so. There are some tricks you can play, but most CAs will basically say, no, we're not going to assign internal stuff. So put does indeed put a lot of burden on uh, in organizations to be able to manage it themselves. Um, that's where going to what Kevin was saying, I think. Learn, you know, integrating and working tighter with IT departments, which especially in larger, larger organizations are more set up uh, to do that kind of thing would be helpful. And I think there are things that we are investigating to provide tooling to make it easier for you to do those type of things. Um, but it's, it's a slow process. A lot of questions um, there. <laughs> I was going to say, Therese, there is one question about how they can subscribe to the basically cybersecurity announcements when we do our tech bulletins. Um, is there a link we can post somewhere uh, where they can subscribe or information somewhere where they can learn to subscribe to do that that you could provide? Um, yes, that's on our the portal on our website. If um, from the top menu, you can see. Um, subscribe to um, Niagara emails and the security bulletins would be part of that. Hey, I, I, um, I just thought of one, um, so I'll ask a question. So I talked about some of the security features of Fortnite really super quickly, uh, specifically the SAML identity provider that we're including with 4.9. Um, I've talked a little bit about some of the enhanced logging. Um, and um, I, I think I think there's some other things that, that we've added, such as, you know, the, you know, the Niagara you know, proxy, uh, you know, working, working better with proxy service services and, and TLS. Uh, are, is there anything else that, that I'm missing that I didn't mention? Who are you asking, Kevin? <laughs> I, I guess I'm asking you guys. I, I think, I, I guess uh, one, what, one change, I'm just kind of answering it out loud. I think one change involves um, 
third-party code signing and validating, um, you know, the, the fact that they're required with 4.9. Um, I'm trying to think of, of is, is there anything else that I haven't mentioned uh, that you guys think I ought to mention? Um, well, you mentioned, yeah, the, uh, in the things like the security dashboard, obviously we've been adding more, uh, more items that are reporting to the security dashboard. Um, obviously we've added uh, some more things related to um, permission groups. Uh, these are smaller things and not major features. Um, the the um, self-hosted IDP for single sign-on is a big one. Um, the security audit log is a big one. Now, somebody did ask related to the audit logs, do we have the ability to uh, forward to um, remote log server? Not currently, uh, that's on our roadmap. Um, I think that's those are the biggest things. Um, to answer that one, Kevin. I did once um, in, in playing with it, I did kind of install a module for doing that, um, extending, uh, I guess, log4j to, to go to a syslog server. Um, although I think that's something that, we'll, that we have in our backlog that we want to take care of, it, care of as well. Correct. Uh, now, Mark asked uh, about what, when do we determine if we're going to do an immediate security fix um, or waiting for the next release? Uh, well, that one is um, actually not, eh, it's an interesting one to ask because um, there, it depends on multiple factors. Certainly, if it's a low or medium security vulnerability, um, we're going to dig into it deeper to determine if it's something we need to fix now or fix in the next release. If it's a higher critical, we pretty much always are going to go fit backport it to supported releases. Uh, the other thing that factors into that, how we do that and whether we can do an update build or a patch is where the, where the vulnerability or risk is identified. Um, in certain parts of the Niagara infrastructure, it requires doing what we call a whole build, uh, which is basically when the issue is down in the core components of Niagara. In those cases, it's, it takes a lot more time to uh, regression test and make sure we haven't broken anything versus a, a defect that's in a module where we can just issue a patch, you just have to upstate, update the module. Uh, all those things go into determining um, when we will issue, how we will issue and fix into what versions. Um, uh, but generally speaking, if we feel it's serious enough, we're going to backport it and, and do our best to for all our supported releases. Um, and I think I think Mike Dennehy is able to to speak as well. Uh, I have a question about uh, if I'm an integrator. Uh, doing integration and installation for the federal government. Uh, I know that there is you know, work that, that we've done related to the uh, government's risk management framework for accreditation and all the requirements that I need to adhere to. Uh, where do I get started and where do I go to get all that stuff? There is a uh, link on the Tritium site called RMF. RMF is an acronym for Risk Management Framework, which is the criteria primarily for DOD, but it also extends over into some other federal agencies and, and commercial. We have a PDF, too, on the website that gives you all the FAQ on RMF specifically, Kevin. Okay, great. Also got a question about um, upgrading Niagara systems, and I know uh, that Tritium has you know, trade-up programs and, and things like that. Uh, Mike, do you have any info about how they can get further information? There's, there's actually several trade-up programs going on, but the key one has got to do with uh, legacy JSES, right? Anything below a JS8000 and upgrading to Niagara Force or your security compliance. So um, again, on the website, one of the main uh, banners right at the top on the homepage takes you down to uh, an area where you can have a presentation on that, a PDF, and then some uh, detail on the various programs. It goes through the whole year. So you and your clients would have time to implement still. Essentially what it does is it works through our channel partners to provide a discount um, for end users who want to upgrade to N4 and become compliant. Gotcha. Yeah, I think that's really important. Um, you know, bringing the security of your systems up, up to par with everything else and also taking advantage of the, the cybersecurity features. 
Well, I think we have time for one more question. If if you guys have one queued up, James or, or Bill. Uh, we can throw you under the bus, Kevin. Um, yeah, please. Yeah, I'm used to it. Okay. Uh, there was a question. What's the biggest vulnerability that people with outdated Tritium systems face? Uh, like, you know, insecure Fox port 1911 or being exposed publicly on Shodan, uh, a brute force attack or a denial of service attack. Like what do you see as kind of the biggest vulnerability for these unpatched outdated systems? Yeah, really, really good question. I, I, I think the answer is, is probably a little complex. Uh, I guess I would have to go back and, and I would have to look and, um, and score all the vulnerabilities that we've patched over the years. Uh, but many of these are public, and when they're public and they're 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 posted by U.S. CERT, everybody knows, and and hackers know, and it's easy for hackers to uh, write programs to exploit this. And so, um, it, I can't really pinpoint one specific one, but it is it is crucial, especially in today's cyber environment. Um, where attacks are happening, uh, not just from, from human users, but from bots that are trying known vulnerabilities, it's, it's incredibly important that, that your systems are up to date. Uh, I, can't, I can't even uh, count the number of vulnerabilities that we have found internally or have been externally found that we've, that, that we've fixed over, over the years, um, but it's a lot. And so that's why, that's why it's just crucial that, that you keep yourselves up to date. Well, um, I'm sorry I, uh, we went over a little bit, uh, but I think this is an important presentation. Um, and there's a lot of information that everybody needs to digest, I know. Uh, that's why the presentation is going to be on the website. There are a lot of links in there. Um, I hope you take advantage of these. Um, you'll, you'll find... Um, Again, some Tritium specific resources, but not only that, some, some other really good helpful resources for you to get started, including that uh, CISA publication that I talked about. So thank you very much. Thank you for joining. Um, and we look forward to seeing you next time, hopefully live. Take care. Bye.